browsing workstation cards looking for potential gaming bargains in 2022 feels like scraping a particularly crusty barrel. But sometimes I happen upon something that isn't just promising, but damn well exciting. With modern API support, some modern driver support in the form of aftermarket drivers, and an absolutely cavernous amount of VRAM, this Fire Pro has potential. Last year, I looked at the R9 380, a consumer Radeon card based on the Tonga GPU. I like that card a lot. It had flaws, of course, but VRAM wasn't one of them. The model I had was the 4GB variant, and as such, very few games needed dropping to low texture quality settings in order to avoid frame drops. Very few, but not all. Even a 4GB frame buffer can be exceeded in the latest games, and that's where the FirePro W7100 comes in. While, on the one hand, this card, designed for a professional working environment rather than gaming, has lower clock speeds than the 380, it's somewhat overcompensates for this with a massive 8GB of GDDR5. Some games, notably Call of Duty Warzone, tend to look decidedly previous gen at low settings, so here's hoping that the extra VRAM means the W7100 can not only make games perform well, but look good too. As Fire Pro cards are designed for servers and workstations, there isn't much call for oversized cooling systems or power delivery, as you probably can't help but have noticed, this card is almost painfully thin, occupying only a single slot and with only one very small fan. Despite being otherwise fairly clean, mine ramped up to over 80 degrees in a matter of moments, prompting me to open it up, clean off the rather crusty thermal compound, and replace it with some Arctic MX4. Now it runs a hell of a lot cooler and quieter, dropping about 20 degrees and without having to run its fan at full speed most of the time. As is usual for my 2022 test suite, I'm running everything through my moderately priced gaming PC, featuring a 6-core Ryzen 5 5600G, and then trying a second pass with 2 cores switched off, and clock speeds reduced to simulate something closer to the Steam hardware surveys idea of the average gaming PC. God of War's minimum requirements suggest you should probably be fine with a 4GB graphics card, but according to the in-game VRAM indicator, the original settings preset already exceeds that by about 300 meg. In this instance then, the W7100 could already hold an advantage over its non-workstation counterparts. Thankfully, the GPU has just enough horsepower to back this up, running regular combat at an average of just over 30 FPS. Although, cutscene performance does drop periodically, and you should be ready to drop settings further in busier scenes. What's most disappointing about this is that the numbers line up almost perfectly with the R9 280, a card that occupied the same space in the GCN1 lineup as Tonga did for GCN3. On the positive side, the W7100 has more than double the available VRAM, allowing for the use of the high quality textures while losing only a single frame per second. Moving up to Ultra gives a warning regarding available system RAM and page file, but I didn't notice a performance difference during my benchmarks. I also didn't really notice a difference in quality either, though your mileage may vary in that regard. Final Fantasy VII Remake mostly relies on dynamic resolution scaling to keep close to 60fps, so every lower-end GPU I've tested so far runs at about the same frame rate, but with varying levels of sharpness. The W7100 visually looks a lot closer to cards like the GTX 960, and runs similarly. Like with that card, 1% lows dip into the 20s, thanks to frame time spikes during combat. There isn't a noticeable benefit to the extra VRAM, with one possible exception. I've noticed some lower end cards have issues rendering these Dementor things in the cutscene, whereas the W7100 clearly has no trouble with them. I can't say for definite whether or not this is due to the bigger frame buffer, but it makes a kind of sense to me that this might be the case. The performance difference between medium and very high in the Guardians of the Galaxy benchmark is about 10%. Medium averages 41 FPS and bumping textures up to high has no impact on this. Using the very high preset drops the average FPS to 38. And that would seem like a no-brainer, 
except that the rather visually complex opening level sees performance way below this, and dropping from very high to medium takes you from the low 20s to high 20s. I still haven't gotten around to playing past this opening area, and I have to assume that later levels are less intensive than this one, but if you're playing this for the first time, the difference between the benchmark and gameplay could come as something of a nasty shock. Older AMD architectures have not impressed me in Forza Horizon 5, and GCN3 is no different. It is possible to obtain a playable frame rate at 1080 medium or high, so long as you're happy driving along at 30 FPS with occasional drops into the 20s. Adding FSR to 1080 high doesn't do much, but it does give me a point of comparison. My Ryzen 5 5600G's integrated Vega 7 graphics scored substantially higher. Halo Infinite is demanding enough that no amount of overcompensating with VRAM is going to help here. The Tonga GPU can't really push more than about 40 FPS, even at low settings. At 1080 with 71% resolution scaling, averages only manage to scrape under 30 FPS in single player open world gameplay. Multiplayer did a little better, with averages of 38 and 1% lows of 30 in a big team battle, both on the 6 core and 4 core setups. Cyberpunk 2077 shows a pretty huge jump in generational performance. With the W7100, 1080 low gets the kind of frame rates the R9 280 only saw by adding quality FSR, essentially equivalent to 1280x720. What's more, if you prefer the better overall image quality of medium settings, applying FSR ultra quality gives essentially the same FPS as at 1080 low, which so long as you don't mind the slightly softer image, is probably the best choice overall. Sure, it's only 30 FPS, but on the other hand, it's Cyberpunk at 30 FPS on a 2014 workstation card. Not bad. There's nothing separating the quad-core and six-core results in Rainbow Six Extraction. At 1080 high, average FPS reaches 49, and lows only drop slightly from 30. For a co-op PvE game, this might be the right balance for you, but if you're determined to get a more esports-like experience, the W7100 can push frames over 60 FPS, but only by using resolution scaling. Using the variable scaler should do the trick, but for my testing I stuck to a fixed 50% scaling that resulted in a 71 average FPS and 47 FPS minimum. On the other hand, Splitgate really benefits from higher FPS, and the W7100 can do the job for the most part. You'll probably want to drop from the Epic Settings preset, especially if you have a high refresh monitor, but for consistency across my videos I tested at 1080 Epic. The results were good, but not great. Don't get me wrong, 98 FPS averages and 73 1% lows are very playable, but for context this is the lowest score I've seen so far this year from a discrete GPU, lower in fact than the R9 280. And in more bad news, the W7100 can't quite hit 60 FPS in Call of Duty Vanguard, at least not at native resolution. Averages are 55 and lows just over 30 on the 6 core and just under 30 on the quad core. Adding ultra quality FSR is all the compromise needed to push past the 60 FPS mark on average, and dropping one notch further to quality almost reaches 70. You probably have room to increase texture and shadow resolution if you really want to, but I'm not sure I'd see the point at what is effectively just 1280x720. While it is perfectly possible to run Fortnite in performance mode and guarantee insanely high FPS, that's more of a CPU test than anything. 
as I'm testing a GPU, I ran the game in the good old DX12 renderer at 1920x1080 with Pro settings, and the W7100 did remarkably well. On the 6 core setup, averages scraped under 120, and lows stayed barely above 60. The quad core didn't do quite so well, but still averaged 105 and dropped only into the low 50s. That might not sound brilliant, but well, it's Fortnite, you kind of have to get used to the stutter. Battlefield 2042 isn't going to be a competitive experience on the W7100 without making some compromises. 1080 low, and yes, I turned up textures just because I could. 1080 low averages in the high 40s and dips into the mid 30s, while the quad core setup is about 7 to 10% lower. To break 60 requires dropping resolution, and unfortunately, I had to go all the way to 1280 by 720 to do so. The good news is the game runs at 65 FPS and only drops into the mid 40s. The bad news is you're now playing hard mode. Warzone scores are remarkably similar to those seen in Battlefield. The W7100 once more scores in the 40s at full 1080 and again requires a resolution drop, this time using the scaling slider set to 66% to reach a 60fps average. On the positive side, I was able to make use of the 8GB frame buffer. Warzone has a nasty habit of dropping texture quality to the point where objects and scenery look almost untextured, and having 8 gigs to play with means I could max out the texture and shadow resolution sliders without worrying. Of course, at an effective resolution of about 1280x720 and with Filmic AA enabled, the game looks as soft as British sanctions, but it at least makes the game look slightly less janky. I usually don't feel the need to test GTA 5 on modern, powerful GPUs, but it is still incredibly popular and I don't think there are any other benchmarks on YouTube for this particular card, so I gave it a quick test in the standard run, as popularised by Crisp. Of course, as is now traditional, I took the time to kill Jack. At 1080 with a pretty high selection of settings, the game is still exceptionally smooth, running at about 75 FPS with 1% lows in the mid 50s. Not that it should be any surprise, of course. GTA 5 turns 10 years old next year, a fact which I'm sure a billion YouTubers will continue to remind us of until the end of time. GTA 6 really can't come soon enough. So, I might have made a bit of a big deal about this card's massive buffer, but as is often the case with older cards, it seems there simply isn't enough power here to leverage it. The consumer version of this GPU back in 2014 was the R9 285, which was limited to 2 gigs of VRAM, an amount that would see that card struggle with or even fail to launch some of the titles in my test suite. If that had been the end of the story, then I can see a good argument for buying a W7100 over an R9 285. The thing is, the consumer grade Tonga GPU saw a revision in 2015 in the R9 380, a card frequently available with 4 gigs of VRAM. Given the gaming benefit of the Radeon cards over Fire Pros, notably better cooling and overclocking control, an R9 380 or 380X for similar money would make a far more practical purchase. If you happen to have a W7100 as part of a workstation or that you got a particularly good deal on, it can happily run the latest games in 2022. Just don't go bragging about how many gigabytes it has, nobody's going to be impressed. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.